So turn with me once again um, for the final message in the Song of Solomon, chapter 6. And the title is, Are You Fighting Fair, Part 3. Are You Fighting Fair, Part 3. Now, in part one of this study, we saw two things that we are not to do in conflict. Number one, we do not react, meaning that we do not reenact what your spouse has done to you. Number two, allow God to change the other person. We can't change anybody. Only God can. Meaning leave your spouse in God's hands. And we saw how effective this was when God convicted the wife when she acted in selfishness towards her husband. Then in part two of this study that we saw last week, that we should have liquid myrrh dripping from our lips, which means uh, that we are to be forgiving and that we are willing to bury the past. Then we saw that the wife described Solomon's hands in such loving terms, meaning that in conflict, we should never allow it to get physical. Men, you should never put your hands on a woman in a way that is unbiblical and ungodly and vice versa. Ladies, stay out of your husband's face. Stay out of his face. I told you, I mentioned last week that we're just physically stronger than you. You get in our face, one push of the hand, one, one Heisman pose. And you going flying across the room. It's just because, stay out of his face like that, coming up on him like you're in the hood or something. you coming up on him like you want some smoke or something. And you probably do, but you really don't want that. Because one push of the hand, you flying across the room. So you don't, it, stay out of his face. Now. We're going to look at how to communicate with our spouses and how to listen to what they're saying. Men, pay close attention to what I'm about to say because it can save you some headaches in your marriage. And, and there are too many women frustrated over the lack of communication and, and, and lack of us listening to them. And I want to help you uh, with that today. Now, remember, we left off with Solomon's wife going out to look for him to apologize for ignoring his needs and acting in selfishness. Now, this is, this is free right here. You know, I always lay gold at your feet. Well, this is free right here. Always be quick to apologize when you offend your spouse. Let me just say that again. Always be quick to apologize when you offend your spouse because the more time you allow to pass before you apologize, Satan will give you a reason not to apologize and give you justification for why you shouldn't apologize. So always be quick to apologize like this woman is doing. Now let's dive in verses one and two. It says, where has your beloved gone, O fairest among women? Where has your beloved turned aside that we may seek him with you? My beloved has gone to his garden, uh, to a bed of spices, to feed his flock in the garden, and to gather lilies. Now, Solomon's harem asked her, the Shulamite woman, in verse 1, where is your beloved? And she responded, I want you to notice, she responded by saying, he is in his garden and feeding his flock. Notice, notice how she knew right where to find him. Men, when you're in conflict, does your wife know where to find you? Notice, I want you to notice how she can answer to his whereabouts. She is not calling all of his friends asking, have you seen so-and-so? Notice how he was not in a bar or club drinking or dancing his problems away. No, he was in his garden feeding his flock. Now, gardens in the Bible seem to imply the place to get along with God, Adam, got along with God in the Garden of Eden in Genesis 3 and verse 9 for you note takers. 
Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane to get alone and to talk to the Father just before he went to the cross in Matthew 26 and verses 36 to 46. Men, let us go to our gardens where we are in, when we are in conflict, should I say, with our spouses. Let's go to the place where we can get along with God. First of all, let me just ask this, ask this. Do you even have a garden that you can get along with God? Do you have a place that you go where you can get along with the Lord? See, this is so very important because Jesus, when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, you remember, Jesus prayed. He said, oh, Father, I let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. See, it is in the Garden that our wills are broken so God's will can be done. It's in the Garden See, if you, when you're in conflict, it's so good to go to the garden because when you're in conflict, if you go to the TV or you go to get with your boys, now they will affirm you in your position. But when you go to the garden, that's where your will is broken. And so God's will can come forth and God will say, you know you need to apologize, don't you? Yes, Lord, and you leave the garden saying, yeah, honey, I, I'm, I, I'm sorry. See, when you go to your boys or you go to the TV, you're sitting there stewing. First quarter's ended and she hasn't come to apologize yet. It's halftime and she hasn't come yet. See, now you, you're, getting, you're, getting, you're getting upset now. But when you go to the garden, that's... That's where your will is broken. And God begins to speak to you. And then what comes forth is his will, not your will. Look what it says there in, in verse 3. It says, I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. He feeds his flock among the lilies. You know, every time I read this verse, I kind of smile because <laughs> my wife and I, We've been together since we were teenagers. And, you know, back in the day, you know, we, we used to have these little shirts. You know, we were twinning. You know, we go to the amusement park. We had these shirts. And then on the back, you know, the big old block letters, you know, they wasn't all that good cursive stuff today. It was big block letters. I am yours and he is mine, you know. It, and that's what we had on the back of our shirt. Everybody know we were twinning, you know, as we were at the amusement park. And so when I read this, I am my beloved and my beloved is mine. I just kind of smile. I think of those shirts that I can still see in my head. And we, would, we were all, we were so dorky as little teenagers. And we just we had those little shirts on. Uh, but it, it, it was something. So what, what Solomon is saying, he is saying no matter what conflict comes our way, we belong to one another. She knew where to find him and he knew where to find her. Ladies, notice that she didn't run home to her mama when conflict came. Notice that. This is one of four major problems in a marriage. Drum roll please. In-laws. The man's mother coming in between him and his wife. The wife's mother coming in between her daughter and her husband's. In-laws, back away from your children's marriages. Back away. Notice only the more seasoned saints are the ones that's, that's clapping right now. But I want you to notice the common denominator, the mom. Because we as men, we don't care. <laughs> Unless there is abuse. Now that's a whole nother sermon. Unless there is abuse. We don't care. We like, honey, we constantly saying to our wife, honey, stay out of it. Let them figure it out. We had to figure it out in our day. We had to figure it out. Let them figure it out. Stay out. I'm going to come back to that. Like I said, keep out of their marriage unless there is some type of abuse. So, this leads me to the four common problems in all marriages. Number one, the man's mother. 
Number two, the woman's mother. Number three, sex. And number four, money. That's pretty, that's pretty easy. Easy stuff. Four problems in every marriage. Now, let me give you three things not to do when you're in conflict. A, don't run home to your mother unless there's abuse. We already talked about that. B, don't stomp out the door. I'm going to come back to that. C, don't go off with friends to talk about your spouse. I'm going to come back to that as well. Look what it says there in verse 4. It says, Oh, my love, you are as beautiful as Terza, lovely as Jerusalem, awesome as an army with banners. Now, notice what are the first words to his wife as they were coming together for reconciliation. They were words of praise. He called her his love. He spoke of her beauty. He didn't say, that's right, you need to be coming to me. Should have came to me a long time ago. Took you so long. You know you were wrong, don't you? You know you were wrong. No, 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 that's not what he did, no. He, he talked about her beauty. He sung her praises. It, it reminds me of King Ahasuerus in the book of Esther. You got to understand this. You, you just can't make this stuff. Y'all ought to read this Bible. It's just so good. You, you know, it reminds me of King Ahasuerus. Ahas, King Ahasuerus had a wife named Vashti. Oh, she was fine. Good looking woman. So he got all his people that he was over about 127 areas that he was over. So he had a big old banquet for them all, had them all come. He said, oh, I know my wife is good looking. I'm going to have Vashti come on out and just have a parade around, have all the men just say, oh, man, she's pretty. So he said, Vashti, you know, go get Vashti. Have her, have her come on out. Vashti said, I ain't coming out there. They said, the king said, come on out here. She said, I ain't coming out there. And the guy came back and said, King, she said, she ain't coming, but she ain't about that life. She ain't coming. He said, what? And so some of the other guys heard. They said, whoa, 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 King. Now, if our wives hear what your wife just did, they're going to be dissing us publicly. So you better, you better check that. Get that in check. So enough. He said, okay, Vashti, you don't want to come out? You're done with being queen. Get out. You're done. Kicked her to the curb. So you remember in the book of Esther, they had a beauty pageant, and Esther won. So, you know, but they said, okay, here's the, here's the stipulation. No one can come to the king without being summoned. I don't care what the issue is. So Ahasuerus, his right-hand man was a guy named Haman. He hated the Jews and wanted to kill the Jews. So Mordecai, Esther's uncle, said, look here. Don't think because you're in that, that, that queen little suite you got there that you're going to be exempt. You're a Jew just like us, and you're going to be dead too. You better go to the king. She said, look, I can't go to the king. Nobody is to go to the king. You better get in there. She said, okay, fast and pray for three days, and after that, I'll go in. So all of a sudden, they, once again, the king threw a party. He loved the party. Threw another party. And Queen Esther got all decked out, dressed up, evening gown, and, you know, she was about to go down the red carpet, and she was just red. And so she bust open the doors, and everybody was like, oh, she was not summonsed. She's going to be dead. And King Ahasuerus saw that woman. He said, oh, oh, Esther. What is it that you want to hand it out the scepter to her? He could not get over her beauty. Now, I said all that to say this. Men, how often do you tell your wife she's beautiful? Or when was the last time you told her that she's beautiful? And vice versa. Yeah, ladies, okay, yeah, your husband, hey, you know, he, he, he got a dunlap. His stomach dunlapped over his belt. <laughs> but you ain't high school weight yourself. <laughs> so so it, this thing goes both ways. I don't know why you always trying to get out of high school weight. You, you were 
teeny bop teenager. You, you grown now. You need your grown folk body, your grown woman body, and we getting our grown man body. Now, that doesn't mean we don't do something about that dumb lap. Now, you know, we, you know, if you crunch it, you push back from the cheesecake a little bit. But when was the last time meant that you told her that she was beautiful? See, men, you don't want other men to deposit beautiful points into your wife's emotional account. And none of this stuff, well, she knows. Well, how? Because you told her or someone else told her? Solomon immediately talks about her beauty. He immediately sung her praises. I sing my wife's praises and I tell her how beautiful she is and this is no hyperbole. Easily a thousand times a day. Easily. So if another man tries to deposit beautiful points in her emotional account, she will look up, probably roll her eyes and just say, my husband told me that a thousand times before I left the house. I'm always telling, we've been, like, we've been together over 42 years. I am telling her every day how beautiful she is. Every single day. And she just says, not today. I say, yeah, today. And tomorrow, and the Lord let us see that. And the next day as well. Every day of the week and twice on Sunday. I'm telling her. I'm always letting her know I'm near. I come by and I just touch her or I rub her leg and I'm coming by letting her know I'm around, letting you know a fully grown man is around you. <laughs> All the time. She knows it because I tell her. I always let her know she knows when I'm near. She's not like, you know, I, I come up and she's like, ooh, just freaked out. Because of, no, no, she knows. Here he is again. I hear it. <laughs> yes. Yes. Every day. Matter of fact, I, I, I did again in between service before I came out second service. I just see where we were in my office. I just said, oh, you're just so beautiful. Oh, just look at you. Just so beautiful. Oh, and I'm about that life. Yes, I have the gift of gab, and I'm a man of words, yes. But I'm going to use them to pour it all on my wife. So she will never, never, it's none of this stuff like, oh, do you think I'm beautiful? You know what you do when you, you're trying to get something out of your, your husband. Yeah. Do you think I'm, I'm beautiful? Yeah. Oh, you know, my wife would never have to say that because before she get the thought in her head, I'm already telling her. Already telling her, oh, look at you in this. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my. And I'm just, and I just touch, and I just go, and I go by her. And even if we got a house full of people, I go by her and just. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I am about that life. That's what I'm on. So, so man, you, because as time goes on, as time goes on, what, what happens, let me save that because I got to get to that in a few minutes. Let me just look, look at verses six and seven. I'm going to get to that in a minute. Notice it says, your teeth are like a flock of sheep, which have come up from the washing. Everyone bears twins, and none, of, and none is barren among them. Like a piece of pomegranate are your temples behind your veil. Now, this is, this is amazing. She's looking at his mouth. Remember, she's going down his body, started with his hair and all that stuff, and talked about his eyes. Now she's at his mouth. His mouth was right. Um, we will say his grill, his grill was right. He, 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 he didn't look like he was chewing on some bricks or like a jack-o'-lantern. His, his grill was right. And, and it says that his, his teeth, notice, notice she describes his, his, his teeth are like a flock of sheep which have go, come up from the washing. 
He washed his, he brushed his teeth. Everyone bears twins. Notice, and none of is bearing among them. He didn't have missing teeth. Get, get your grill right, okay? Most, almost everybody got good insurance now. Get your grill right. If your grill not right, get your grill right. Go to the dentist. Say, Pastor Tony told me my grill's not right. <laughs> get your grill squared away. You want to be able to her, her to describe. And, and, and one thing that I, I love about my wife, my wife has the one of the best smiles in all the world. It lights up, lights up the world. Why? Because see, you see, got that, that chocolate skin. I love chocolate. You know, I love chocolate. Got that chocolate, that chocolate going on, as I call it. And then those, those white teeth. And it just lights up the world. Boom! <laughs> and, and I just love it. It's nothing, everyone knows it's nothing like a beautiful smile. There's nothing like that. And many don't smile because their their grill not right. Get your grill squared away so you can smile with us. I'm just saying. Get just, I mean, everybody got, well, almost everybody got some pretty good insurance now. Just make sure your grill is squared away. This is what she described. I'm not making this up. This is what she's describing here. See, now, I want you to bring something to your attention. These are the same words that he said to her on their honeymoon night. Meaning that his love for her didn't diminish as time went on. Oh, I have to ask you, couples, has your love for one another diminished or deepened since your honeymoon? So often couples grow apart in marriage, especially when children start coming and a wife pours herself into the children because they need her. And I'm not saying they don't need the dad, so don't start tripping. And the husband feels neglected. He pours himself into uh, his career. And, And they forgot that they needed to date one another that what you did to get her, you got to do to keep her. And we forget that because we, th- there's, there's, there's a four-letter word that, that happens when couples get together and get married and kids start coming. It's called L-I-F-E, life. Life happens. And life is every day. And it rolls around. The next thing you know, you're looking up. That baby that was once yelling through the night and crying and diapers and changing, you stink, and you know, all that kind of stuff, you know, baby diapers and all that stuff. And then next thing you know, they're going to kindergarten. And next thing you know, you look up there in high school. Then next thing you know, you're packing them up for college. And it happens just like that. I was looking at one of my grandkids, and I, I looked, and I said, I said, I called her name, and I said, Will, will you be eight on your birthday? She said. I said, when did that happen? Then I, I don't get a chance to see my oldest son and my oldest grandson because they live in Indiana. And so he sent, he sent me a picture. He said, yeah, I'm about to, I'm about to take Ari uh, for his uh, middle school orientation. I said, middle school? I said, I'm thinking he's still in second grade. When did middle school happen? You see how fast time goes? See, because you, you know they say that you can't see the forest for the trees. You're in the midst of it, changing diapers, running around, toddlers and just craziness. And, you know, no! And you just, you know, hear all this stuff and it's crazy. And next thing you know, they just, they, they, they grow up. And all that time, you never cultivated your marriage. You never cultivated your relationship. You just did life together. And watch this. And you end up being a butler married to a maid. Or you end up being roommates that are co-parenting children. And it's not a marriage. Because you never cultivated that. Because L-I-F-E came in. And you got to watch this. Because see, my desire is that this would change as you apply these principles in this book. This couple's love deepened as time went on. Look at verses 8 through 10. 
There are 60 queens, 80 concubines, and virgins without number. My dove, my perfect one, is the only one, the only one of her mother, the favorite of the one who bore her. The daughters saw her and called her blessed, the queens and concubines, and they praised her. Who is she who looks forth as the morning, fair as the moon, clear as the sun, awesome as an army with banners? This is called forgiveness. Solomon is saying in verse 8, there is no one like you. Then he said, you are my dove, my perfect one in verse 9. Uh, you know, a dove, as you heard me mention before, a dove is a bird that's very loyal, very trustworthy. Tr trustworthy. It's a very gentle bird. And notice how he describes his wife as a dove. I had some fun first service when I said, <laughs> ladies, what kind of bird would your husband describe you to be? <laughs> would he describe you as a hawk? <laughs> All you do is just squawk. <laughs> would he describe you as a peacock? Always want to be seen. Showy. It's all about you. It shows you how we are. When you see, you take a group picture, who's the first person you're looking for in that picture? That's who we are. What kind of bird would he describe you to be? Solomon described his wife as a, as a dove. And then he, he called her, notice, he called her his perfect one. See, you know what that means? It means that he had totally forgotten all about what she did to him to cause the conflict. He said, you're my perfect one. You can do no wrong. That's how he described her. That was the kind of dude he was. He said, I see you as my, my perfect one. See, this is how God is with us. He loves us so much that he purposes in his heart not to remember our sins against him. Jeremiah 31, 34 says, I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. This is what Solomon is doing with his wife. In other words, Solomon was acting like God in the home. Men, let me ask you this. This is how we're told, should I say, to act in the home, to act godly or godlike. Men, fathers, we don't realize how important our roles are in the home. We're told to be godly in the home. Why? Because when our children grow up and hear that God wants to be our heavenly father, the first thing our children are going to do is compare God to our fathering. And they are going to wonder if God is going to run out on them, talk to them, or treat them like their father did growing up, we don't realize how important our roles are in the home. They're going to question the eternal love of God because they never had a father in their home that loved them. Or if he was in the home, he was so disconnected from the family and so unloving. See, when, see we don't realize that when people hear that God wants to be their heavenly father and wants to, wants to be in their lives, the first thing they're doing is making a comparison. God, heavenly father, my earthly father. Are there any similarities here? Are there any differences? That's the first thing people are going to do. Unconsciously, they do this. Solomon was acting godly and godlike in the home and he didn't hold her sin against her. Look at verses 11 and 12. I went down to the, the garden, it was a walnut garden, to see the verdure or the, it was a lush green vegetation of the valley 
to see whether the vine had budded and the pomegranates had bloomed before I was even aware my soul had made me as the chariots of my noble people. Now, this is the ultimate of reconciliation. He forgives her to the point where he was parading her on his chariot in front of all the people. He took her down to the garden in verse 11, uh, then down to the lush valley, then down to where the pomegranates had bloomed. He was just parading her around. Look at my dove, my perfect one, parading her around. It's funny, wherever we go out in public, and, you know, when we go on cruises or wherever we go, uh, I'm always, you know, give me your hand. Give me your hand. I want everybody to know she belongs to me. And I parade her on around. We walking on around. My head is up in the air. Look at what I got. Yeah. She belongs to me. Parading her around. Not like she's some show piece, even though she is. But I want them to know she belongs to me. She, she's mine. I'm not walking uh, ahead of her. And there's time because I walk fast, sometimes walking ahead. And then, you know, because I'm a Marine, you already know that. And, you know, in, in, in the Marine Corps, when the front end was going too fast and the little end couldn't catch up, the drill instructor would say, half, half, march, go. And then we cut our steps in half. So there's time by which I'm doing this to let her little legs catch up, catch up to me, catch up to me. And then I go, I'm weird. Yeah, the Marine Corps ruined me. Y'all know that. It just, I, I'm sorry, it ruined me. And I was in the Marine Corps almost 40 years ago, and it still ruined me. I tell people I can go back in today and be locked back into the system. That's just how they trained us. We just weird like that. But this is what he's doing. He's parading her around, showing true forgiveness. Treating a person, see, this is what forgiveness means. Treating the person as if the offense never took place. Do you forgive like this? This is the example Solomon is showing us. This is why we need the Lord in our lives to give us his Holy Spirit to empower us to do what we can't do on our own. You can't live out one single thing I just mentioned without a personal relationship with God. These are not just some, some everyday marriage tips that you're like, okay, I'm going to go put some of that stuff into uh, practice. You won't be able to. You won't be able to. Look at verse 13. It says in verse 13, return, return, O Shulamite, return, return, that we may look upon you. What would you see in the Shulamite, as it were, the dance of, the, of two camps? Now, Shulamite is a nickname. That was her nickname. In Hebrew, it is the feminine form of Solomon's name, which means she belongs to me. Watch this. She is a part of me is what he is saying. Now, do you see how we, how we can possibly grow closer together through conflict? This couple drew closer together through conflict. This verse ends with a party. They were dancing at the end of verse 13. He had paraded her around, then they just do a big party. They were rejoicing after the conflict. So often we have conflict and we're not rejoicing. We stuck on spite. We got unforgiveness. We got anger. We got bitterness. These folks were partying. They about that life. Now, this, this situation shows us two things. Number one, conflict brought them closer together. And so often conflict does the opposite. It, it pushes us apart. No, this conflict brought them closer together. And number two, conflict brought joy in the end. <clears throat> so what helps us to forgive others when we realize how much we have been forgiven? Ephesians 4.32 says, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Are you having a hard time forgiving someone? Look at the cross. See how much you have been forgiven, and it will help you to forgive others. See, see Jesus is dying for your sin. 
It's easy to say, oh, Jesus died for the sins of the world. Yeah, he did. But it's another thing when he said, Jesus died for my lust, my unforgiveness, my anger, my bitterness. Oh, now that changes the game. Because we can always speak in general terms. But when we get specific, it changes the game. Now, I'm going to help you here. I'm about to lay gold at your feet very quickly within the next five minutes. Because we talked about last week, and don't be blown away by the number, because we're going to go through them quickly. 13 don'ts in communicating during conflict, and we're going to give you seven ways on how to be a better listener. We're going to go through them quickly, so don't freak out over the number. Number one, don't speak too soon. Or don't jump the gun during conflict. Hear your mate out. I have a problem with this. This is, this is my issue. I won't let my wife finish because I just jump right in, just, you know. And my wife would lovingly say, I'm not finished. And I would say, but when you going to finish? <laughs> I, at the end of your dissertation? When you going to finish? I'm not finished. And because, see, I, I jump in because I said, no, I, I need to answer this first part first because it will totally cut out the rest of what you're saying if I answer this right here. I, let me get it out. And I got to let it get out. I got to be patient. I jump in. That, that's my thing. And watch this. Proverbs 18, 13 says, he who answers a matter before he hears it, it is folly and shame to him. That's me. Y'all pray for it, bro. I need help. Now, number two, don't confront your mate publicly. Do it behind closed doors. I told you Proverbs 12, 4 says, he who, a woman who causes shame to her husband is like rottenness to his bones. When you shame him either publicly in front of people or publicly in front of the children, a part of him dies. It's like rottenness to his bones. He began to rot on the inside. I've seen a lot of men just die on the inside. Number three, don't confront your mate before the kids. Talked about that. Why? Because you give them an example on how to treat that other parent. If you give it all in his face, doing all that kind of mess, they're going to grow up and disrespect him too. Number four, don't use the kids. Don't bring them into the argument. Hello, Johnny, didn't you hear me last night when you were eating that cookie? Do you remember? Mommy told you the last cookie. Didn't you hear me tell your daddy that not to do this sort of thing? You remember? You tell him, Johnny, stop it. Leave little snot-nosed Johnny out of it. Leave him out. You don't use the kids to, for, for an argument. You don't do that. Number five, don't say you never or you always. You never and you always because they will think up a time about 10, 15 years ago when you did. So don't use you never or you always. Number six, don't get historical. Don't bring up the past. Have liquid myrrh on your lips. We talked about that last week. Number seven, don't raise your voice. Proverbs 15, one says, a soft answer turns away wrath, but grievous words stirs up anger. You see why we need the Lord? Number seven, uh, I already talked about it. Don't raise your voice. Uh, talk sweetly. Oh, I just can't help it. We're loud family. We just loud. Whoa, 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 whoa. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Galatians 5 said the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. So you can help it. Number eight, don't call names. You jerk, you dog, B word, and, or worse. Some folks can string a letter, some four letter, string together some four letter words that I've never seen and heard strung together. Where y'all learn to cuss like that from? Some of y'all are just some cussers. Y'all can just put them together and string them together like you sewing a quilt or something. Y'all can put them together. I've never seen no mess like that. Stop doing that kind of stuff. Don't mention family. My mother said you'd be no good. I should have listened to her. Stop. Stop doing that. Number 10, don't win. I talked about that press for resolution, not victory. Number 11, don't condescend. Speak person to person, not like a parent reprimanding a child. Ladies, your husband is not your child. Even though he may do some childish things, 
He's not your child. Stop talking to him like this. And then some intellectual men, are, they're bad like this too. You begin to, um, uh, because that goes into number 12, don't demean. Don't, don't demean them. You use these, these big college words and you just kind of talk down to, well, see, honey, and da 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 and you just demean them uh, by, by your, your arrogance and your education and all that kind of stuff. Stop demeaning your spouse. Don't make them feel like the scum of the earth. Don't, don't, don't do that. And ladies, let me tell you this. You stop using this. You ain't a man because a real man would do X, Y, and Z. Whoa, 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 don't forget, you picked him. So you, did, so you picked a guy that wasn't a real man. You got to look in the mirror, get, get in the bathroom, look in the mirror and just say, I did this. It'd be therapy for you. It'd be some good therapy. You know, well, that was free. Okay, number 13, don't force a quiet person to talk. Don't push, our quiet people should be saying amen. Don't push them into a corner before they're ready to talk. Ladies, yes, you do have this bad. And, and he's trying to just get some peace and collect his thoughts. Don't, don't, don't go pushing. And no, you're going to talk. You're going to talk and getting all in his face, pushing all up on you. You're going to talk. Hey, easy. Stop. Stop that kind of stuff. Now. How would your mate describe your communicating skills, your communication skills? How would they, just, we're looking at these 13. Now we're going to quickly look at the seven ways to listen to your spouse. Number one, listen with your face. Men, we're not listening while we're still looking at TV or our phones. Give your spouse eye contact. Now, let me just preface that by saying, don't be coming in with some deep bills and, and, and deep, you know, conversations as he's watching the game or watching Sports Center. No, and then if you love me, you're, you're turn it off. <laughs> I love you, but I'm going to keep this on. Or I love you, and he pauses it, and he's sitting there just stewing. I wonder what's going on right now. Did my team score or not? And you just blah, 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 blah. And he's not listening to a word you're saying. So you got to understand what's happening when you're talking to him. And on top of that, man, you got to listen with your face. You got to listen with your face. So my wife knows if I'm in my office, number one, I'm in my office. That means I'm just being with the Lord. Got some, got some God stuff that I'm, I'm dealing with in there. Some messages putting together, just, you know, this stuff. So when she comes in, she knows she has access to come at any time. No knock, no nothing. Just boom, right in there. And what she knows, that I've done this for years. When she comes in, I put my finger where I was reading, and I look up and give her my undivided attention. Now, that is what I've done and still do. It's funny the other day, it, well, just a couple of days ago, she said, move your finger. I said, no, I'm not going to move my finger. I'm, this is where I am. So when you go out and go back to what I was doing, but I'm giving you my undivided attention. Number two, do not reason with your mate. Meaning men, your wife come to you with an issue. You say, okay, honey, this is what is going on. X, Y, Z needs to happen. God bless. See you later. And, and uh, no, whoa, 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 whoa. You think the conversation is over. Sometimes our wives are not looking for a reason. They just want us to just hear them out. We're problem solvers. We hear that there's a problem. And we say, okay, honey, before you get the second sentence out, here's the issue. The issue is this. The problem is this. The solution is X, Y, and Z. All right, God bless. Let me go back to the scheduled programming. They, sometimes they just want us to just hear them out. Just to hear them out. Number three, do not argue. When you argue, no one is being heard. Nine out of ten when you're arguing, the folks are yelling. And when both of y'all yelling, nobody's listening. You're just yelling. And everybody feel a little bit better because you yelled out your, your side. Another person yelled out their side, but it wasn't nobody listening. 
No Bible says that at all. Number four, do not interrupt. I told you I have this problem bad. Pray for a brother because I'm wired to debate. And sometimes I, I bring this quality into conflict and my wife constantly has to say, I'm not finished. And I'm constantly, you know, see for me, because I'm wired to debate, I already got my answer in the chamber. And I'm not really listening to her. I'm waiting on her to finish. Oh, is this, is she, is it, is it? And as soon as I hear like a half a second of silence, boom! I'm, I'm, I'm shooting my response. And she's constantly telling me I'm not finished. I'm like, but when are you going to get finished? I'm ready to give you my answer. So you pray for a brother. Number five, do not stomp out the door. Man up, face the conflict. Cowards and little children stomp out. A little kid, oh, nah, 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 nah. little kids do that. That's what kids do, you know, so do not do that. Number six, do not vent to others. This is breaking trust, meaning do not talk to someone without your spouse knowing about it. Ladies, men do not do well with this. They wonder why the family is looking at them half cocked. Like that little boy over, over in Africa, you know what that mean? They're looking at you like this because she didn't, t she didn't say something crazy about you. At, and then they're looking at you crazy at the reunion, <laughs> at the next party. Do, that's breaking trust. Oh, and I mentioned the first service and I got to mention it here. Do not get in your little family chat talking about your spouse. That's breaking trust. Because here's the thing, when y'all, get it all together, y'all patch everything up, your family is still looking like this. Because they don't know about y'all, you know, kissing and making up. They just know that, you know, he's a, uh, uh, he or she is a terrible human being. But they don't know about the making up part because you don't tell that. You don't put that in your little chat. We made up. No, you left them with this person being a terrible human. That's what you left him with. So you cannot do, that breaks trust. And he feels like he can't trust you because he knows you're gonna run to your little chat and, 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 and tattle on them. Can't do that. And number seven, no rude body language. Stop crossing the arms and stop turning your back. What you're saying is you're not even worthy for me to even look at. So you talk to my back, not to the hand, to my back. And I've seen people, you know, couples, they come in for some counseling, and he got his arm here, she's, she's, she's sit, you know, sitting right next to him, but all of a sudden, her body is kind of turned, <laughs> kind of turned like this. And stop. We kind of stop those particular things. So how would your mate describe your listening skills? Which one or ones do you need God's help to work on? I have a problem with interrupting. What about you? Do you stump out? Do you badmouth your spouse to other people or family members? Do you see how much we need God's help? We can't do this on our own or in our own strength. It's impossible. Let me conclude with this. What are you sensing God saying to you this morning? Let me just say this again. I, I just think that everyone here who is single, you should be in here with pen and paper writing this stuff down because you're going to wish you had listened when you walk down the aisle. And then when this stuff starts breaking off, now, what was that Pastor Tony said? Ah, you turned off because you thought this was about couples. No, this is about you putting it in your hip pocket. I, I said pen and paper. You understand that also mean your little phone and you type it in you, or your little iPad. You know, you know how you do it. So, so this is the thing. What do you sense God saying to you? 
Is he saying that you need to forgive your spouse? Is that what he's saying? Is he saying that you need to get some help in communicating or listening better? Maybe you're here and you're always running home to your mama or stomping out because you got some anger issues. What is God speaking to your heart about this behavior? Men, how are you representing God in the home? What view of God are you uh, showing your children? Are you showing them the view that God is an angry God, an unloving God, an unforgiving God, a standoffish God? Is that what we're showing in the home? Maybe God is saying that you need to get some help in this area. Psalm 46 verse 1 says, God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in time of trouble. Meaning that he is present today to help us in our time of trouble. And there are many marriages and relationships that are in trouble. Will you turn to him for help? Or will you continue to try to fix it yourself? Turn to Christ today as Lord and Savior by repenting of your sins and giving him the control of your life. Asking him to come in. He had changed you from the inside out. And over time, you will look at yourself and those around you will look at you and say, oh, there's something different about you. And they're starting to see Christ in you. You can't do any of this without God's help. And so let's close in prayer so we can ask God to help us in this area. Lord, thank you again for your awesome word. Lord, help us to live this word out. Lord, you know we can't do this without you. Your word says without you we can do nothing, but with you all things are possible. Help us, Lord, to live for you. Help us, Lord, to, oh Lord, to follow what your word says. Lord, I pray if there's anyone here who has not surrendered their lives to Christ, have not repented of their sins and asked Jesus to come into their heart, I pray that they would do that today. I pray, God, that you would draw them to you, draw them to the throne of grace. Draw them, Lord, to your loving arms. Lord, many marriages are messed up. Many relationships are jacked up. But, Lord, you're the God who can fix any situation no matter how dire it looks you're God that can heal you're the great physician Lord I pray for those who have no hope this morning I pray that you show them you're the God of all hope draw us to you by your spirit in Jesus name amen let's stand as you can see, there are some wonderful people that would love to pray with you about the things you've heard today. As the worship team sings their last song, come forward, let them pray with you and for you about the things that God has spoken to your heart. Don't leave here without getting some prayer. You know what's going on in your heart, what's going on in your situation. Come. Let God minister to you. So if this message was a blessing to you, share it on your social media outlets. Because, you know, here at Calvary Chapel, we're committed to making God's word plain one verse at a time. God bless you. Once again, we want to encourage you that if the Lord is speaking to your heart, there's some things you need to get right. You need to seek reconciliation. This is the place, a wonderful place to start is at the place of prayer. Whether it's with a spouse or another family member, friend, co-worker, boss, Lord has called us to the ministry of reconciliation. But let's talk to the Lord. Allow him to guide our actions, guide our thoughts, guide our attitudes. That you come forward and do business with God today as we sing this final song.
no one greater. Here we are, oh Savior, come move, come move, as you make us strong. weakness 
provides opportunity for you to show your strength. And God, there are, there are certainly holes in our thinking, holes in our lives. Lord, where you can make up the lack. Reveal to us, Lord, those ways that we are walking out of step with you, especially concerning our relationships with one another. Show us how to be more loving. Lord, your word says, he who has, begin, who has been forgiven much loves much. And God, we have certainly been forgiven much. So help us to, in turn, show love. Love to you, certainly, but also to one another. So God, as we leave this place, guide us by your will. Let us reconvene through your spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful week. Awesome message from Senior Pastor Tony Clark. Thank you so much for joining us today. If you made a decision to follow Jesus, click the link below. We have a free gift we'd like to give you, as well as some information about your next steps in following Jesus. There's also a link if you simply need prayer or if you want to share with us some encouraging things that God is doing in your life right now. Lastly, if you've been blessed by the ministry at Calvary Chapel Newport News, consider partnering with us financially. There's a giving link that you can click below or you can text Calvary NN to 77977. Your financial gift helps us to reach the world with the message of Jesus Christ. God bless you and until next time, continue reaching up, in, around, and out.